Good morning, and welcome to our study, whether you're here in the congregation or whether you're at home, um, Facebook or YouTube, we welcome you to our study. It's on Joshua chapter 8. You can see the title, I Destroyed and the Covenant Renewal. So we welcome you again, and uh, let's pray. Father God, speak through me. Uh, open our hearts and ears and mind, including mine, that we might learn something, uh, not just from Joshua, but from the story that we can unpack in Joshua 8. Is my prayer in your name. Amen. Okay, let's start off with a couple of questions. At home, answer these here in the congregation. Please feel free to shout out an answer. Did you ever fail an exam in school? When you were in school, did you ever fail an exam? Okay, I'm hearing some yeses. Okay, were you given a second chance? Some heads are going no and some heads are going yes. My lesson came the hard way. I was a freshman at Indiana University, enrolled in a freshman history class. I still remember the professor's name, Dr. Schaefer. I remember him because he cussed a lot. Okay, that's one thing I remember about him. But the second thing is, he told us now we're going to have a midterm, and it's going to really be hard, so you need to study. Well, fresh out of high school, I thought that meant the night before. <laughs> Are you with me? So I go in there, and I did terrible. I got an F on my midterm. And that's kind of embarrassing. And there was a little note from Dr. Schaefer saying, make an appointment to see me. So I did. And we went up to the eighth floor of Ballantyne Hall. That's the big arts and science building on the campus. And um, he had have a seat. How did you study for my midterm the night before? OK, I'll never forget this. OK, Shepherd, not mister. OK, Shepherd, this is the real world of college. If I tell you the exam is on October 15th, you start studying September 15th. Take copious notes. Read the chapters twice. And a week before, and I'll never forget this, a week before, block out at least two hours and study for my exams. Now I have two more. You pass those, you can raise that F. So I took to heart his words, his counsel, and I'm glad to say, with a lot of prayer, that I raised that F up to a B. Dr. Schaefer taught me something. It's really kind of neat to get a second chance. And I know that there were times when I was teaching at Frankfurt High School, the principal would come to me and say, I understand so-and-so failed your exam, your midterm, your final. They may not graduate. Now, that's right. Well, did you know that two nights before her exam, her parents of 25 years divorced? No, I didn't know that. Is it possible, my principal said, she could have been emotionally distraught and that caused her to fail because I checked her record. She's a straight A student. Yeah. <laughs> and then here's these words. Would you feel comfortable in giving her a second chance? Sure. Well, this is before computer. So you had to go home and, you know, use your old Remington and type up an exam. And I gave it to her and she, she aced it. I'm a firm believer in second chances. I bet you are too. Um, and so we're going to talk about a second chance today. And we learn from our, we learn from our failures. So there's going to be a question that's going to be coming up. Um, did you fail on the exam? Did you get a second chance? Matthew Henry, in his Bible commentary of the 1600s, said this. The only failure in life, the only failure in life is the failure to learn. I think he meant to learn from that. Do you agree with that? Good. Because God is going to give Joshua a second chance. Last week we talked about the terrible killing, the 36 soldiers who died at the Battle of A because there had been sin in the Israeli camp. God is going to give them a second chance. And you're taking a look at a map now where you can see exactly where A is compared to Gilgal, compared to Jericho, and compared to another city we'll be talking about a little bit later on, all within walking distance. Maybe a one-day trip of 15, 20 miles, 
on foot, but all of these places are within walking distance. So what God is going to do is this. He's going to give Joshua and the Israeli people a second chance. A second chance. The difference this time is God's in the plan. Last week, the spies came back and told Joshua, we can take that city. We don't need 30,000 troops like we had around Jericho, a couple of thousand will do. At no place in Joshua 7 did they pray. Did Joshua pray? Did they consult the priests? God was not in the first plan. It failed. So I think there's a lesson here for you and me as individuals, as families, and as a church. Include God in the plan. Better yet, let him make the plan. Okay, but God will confirm this in, 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 uh, chapter, in chapter 8, verse 1. In chapter 8, verse 1, God says this to Joshua. Don't be afraid. Don't you like that? Don't be afraid. For I have delivered into your hands the king of Ai, his people, his city, his land. He goes on in verse 2. You can do to Ai what you did at Jericho. Remember Jericho, the walls came tumbling down, everything was destroyed, uh, the gold and silver and mental cups go into the treasury, but take nothing for yourself, which of course Achan violated when he did that. But notice what he says, you can do to I what you did at Jericho and her king, except, except, you can now carry off the plunder and the livestock for yourselves. Excuse me? Yeah. This time, with me in charge, whatever you take is plunder. It's the spoils of war. Now, go sit up in ambush. Go sit up in ambush. So I think it's important. We go back to Deuteronomy. One of the things that um, I've learned from this, this, this research is when you, read, when you read the book of Joshua, there's so much connected in other books. Exodus, Numbers. You learn a lot about Joshua from reading other books and how these are interrelated. So if we go to Deuteronomy chapter 20 verses 16 to 18 Deuteronomy 20, 16 to 18 you can see them on the screens okay inside the promised land inside the promised land you are to destroy everything outside the promised land Talk with the people. See if they're willing to make, make a treaty. Okay? But inside the promised land, everything is to be destroyed. Outside the promised land, negotiate a treaty. If they will sign the treaty, then they can work for you in servitude. They can be your slaves. If not, then you go to war with them. Notice what God is doing here. He's changing his mind. Is he not? Things are going to be different. Okay? Here at I... Kill the soldiers, but the women and the kids and the cattle are yours. Now, why all this killing? Because, well, I'll tell you something. If you read Joshua and you stop at verses 8, you're thinking ethnic cleansing. You're thinking they're out to gain land and territory and riches and people. No. They've been assigned a task by God to cleanse the promised land, which I promised to Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and the rest of them. Because what they're doing is abominable. It's wrong. It's sinful. All kinds of occult practices. Worshiping the moon. Human sacrifice. Prostitution at the altars. It's abominable. I want these areas clean. I want these areas clean. So one commentator suggested this. The reason why Joshua and the Israelites lost the first battle of Ai was because of internal problems. Sin. There was sin in the community. And this commentator suggested that sometimes the church faces internal problems. And the examples that this one commentator gave was false doctrine, false teachers. As I've told my Sunday school class on countless number of times, I think it's so important that you bring this and you open this, and that every lesson has to be connected to the Bible some way. And if you think the teacher, in this case me, is far out in right field, not even in the ballpark, you need to let me know. You need to challenge that. Because you don't, I don't want to be guilty of false doctrine. 
and false teaching. If you read the New Testament letters, what's one of the things that Paul always talked about? Watch out for those false teachers. They're teaching false doctrine. They'll lead you astray. So it could very well be the reason for the defeated eye, battle one, was internal sin. But maybe there were also external problems. Remember, the king of Ai had less troops than the Israelis did, and yet they won that battle and killed 36. And Randy mentioned something today, and no, we don't compare notes. The churches today in America are facing internal problems. False doctrine, false teaching, maybe apathy, declining attendance, but it's also facing external problems. Any of you in the audience here or at home, if you take a stand for God, if you take a stand for his church, if you take a stand for his word, I've listed these from an, uh, an author. You're going to be accused today of being narrow-minded, too strict, extremely judgmental, not loving, aloof, out of touch with reality. So the churches today face internal problems and face external problems. And for those of you people who enjoy doing any kind of Google research, just type in Barna, B-A-R-N-A. -A. The Barna Group does a tremendous amount of studies of churches, <clears throat> excuse me, not just Baptist churches, but Christian churches, Presbyterian churches, and they publish this for preachers and staff. They publish data of the current situation in churches. And I read the most recent one from pastors, several thousand pastors were interviewed, and they said one of the problems that they're facing as a church leader is apathy. Apathy. Now, as a high school teacher and as a student, a teacher at West Georgia, I encountered students who didn't care. They didn't want to be there. They were apathetic. But I thought, wow, people in the pews, Christian people at home, apathetic, and that's what preachers are battling today? So it looks to me like we can pull a couple of lessons from that battle. But the good news is, the good news is they win. God is there. He changed his mind. They can take the spoils of war. So it's a great battle plan. Joshua, take 30,000 troops. Have 5,000 go behind the city walls. That leaves you 25,000. Fake an attack. Fake an attack. Make it look like you're going to attack the city walls. And then fall back. Now you know what's going to happen. The king and all of his soldiers will chase you. They will leave the walled city and they will chase you. They will come after you. And after you have faked your defeat, you will turn around, and we'll have a picture of this in just a minute, and you will raise your javelin, and that'll be the signal for those 5,000 troops to come from behind the city walls, enter the city, set it afire. And then they will attack from the rear. So you've got 5,000 attacking from the rear, and you've got 25,000 who, when they see the javelin, will turn around and attack from the front. And as we'll find out, all of the soldiers and the troops in the city are killed. The spoils of war are kept, and the city is burned down. We move on. The king is captured. Now, the king is going to be hanged. Okay, I did some research on that verb. You hang people, but pictures are hung. So I wanted to make sure I had the right verb. Okay, now depending on the Bible translation you're using, it'll say that the king of Ai was hanged on a tree. Your Bible may say impaled on a pole. Either way, <laughs> he was hanged, okay? Because Deuteronomy 21, 22 says, for anything hanging on a tree is a curse of God. So whether it was a tree or a pole, the king is hanged. At sundown, he is taken and he is buried. Now I want to go back to this, um, this Joshua and his javelin. In just a second, we'll be seeing a, a picture. That may be what it was like. Because he had to be elevated for his troops to see him. And at that given moment, when he held up his javelin, 
That's when the battle turned. That's when, as I say, the tide turned and the victory was ensured. Now, Moses, on a couple of occasions, held up his rod. When they parted the Red Sea, the rod was held up. When they battled the Amalekites, one of the first major battles, Moses' arm got tired. And as his arm lowered with the rod, the Israelis were being defeated. So here came Aaron and Hur, and they held up his arm so the troops could see the held rod. And as long as that was held up, they won. And the same thing, I think, applies here to Javelin. And I think it's interesting about signs. Now, those of you who love baseball, okay, and you watch baseball, when the camera pans on the manager, he'll be giving all kinds of signs. If you watch football yesterday or this afternoon, coaches sometimes will hold up signs, sending in a play. Colleges will have three or four guys on the sidelines doing all kinds of fancy maneuvers, and only one is passing the real sign. Basketball is a lot simpler. Zone defense, man to man. Signs are important, and I'm leading up to the sign of the covenant, because this is going to be an unbelievable sign that God once renewed. And so we're going to move on. We're going to move on to a couple of the mountains, and there they are. And I want to pause there for just a minute, because something takes place here I never, ever thought about, dreamed about, probably skimmed over, never once absorbed it. So let's, let's unpack this, OK? There you see Mount Gerzim on the left, Mount Ebal on the right. Now, these two mountains have a tremendous historical perspective. And right smack dab in the middle is going to be a village called Shechem. OK? And we'll, <clears throat> excuse me. We'll talk about that in, in, um, in just a minute. But I think it's important for you to visualize this particular scene, because history is going to be played out. A sign is going to be given. OK? So here we go. One of the things that Joshua did when they crossed the Jordan River, when they camped at Gilgal, when they destroyed Jericho, when Achan and his family were killed and they put stones, they put up monuments. Those monuments were made of uncut stones, not made by human hand. And I, I never could figure out why. Exodus chapter 20, Verse 25 says, you do not want to defile an altar for me with man-made stones. God is speaking. I don't want altars made of man-made stones. And one commentator said this, and I had never thought about that. On those man-made stones, it was quite possible that there were idol images, images of the moon, of Baal, of prostitution, of a snake, of Satan, because we know that in the Promised Land, the occult was practiced. So on some of these man-made monuments, you might have symbols of their gods or goddesses. This god says, I don't want that. I want uncut stone. So every time that we have or will talk about a monument, it's going to be monuments of uncut stones. Now, why is this picture so important? Deuteronomy chapter 27 says, there'll be cursings, curses read from Mount Ebal. There'll be curses. Now, if you read Deuteronomy 27, you'll read about 12 specific curses. Don't sleep with your father's wife. Don't change borders. Don't cheat. Don't lie. There's 12. When you go to Deuteronomy chapter 28, there's 12 blessings. So picture this. Okay, you're going to have at least 12 curses read, Deuteronomy 27. At least 12 blessings read, Deuteronomy 28. Well, what's this going to look like? How's this, what, what, you know, what's, what's going on? Okay, God had told Moses, when you enter the Promised Land, when you enter the Promised Land, go to Mount Gerizim and read the good, and go to Mount Ebal and read the bad. You can find that in Deuteronomy chapter 11. 
So, picture this. At Mount Gerizim, the good mountain, the tribes of Simeon, Levi, Judah, Iskar, Joseph, and Benjamin. At Mount Ebal will be the six tribes, Reuben, Gad, Asher, Zebulun, Dan, and Naphtali. You can read all this in Deuteronomy 27. All of this was forecasted to God, by God, to Moses, who then will tell it to Joshua. And then here's something that boggles my mind. After the battle of Ai, and the king has been buried, and the city destroyed, and hostages and cattle taken, they're going to march from Ai to that valley, to those two mountains. And the reason for showing you that map at the beginning, you've probably got some good maps in the back of your Bible. That's a 25-mile walk. Notice I didn't say drive. That's a 25-mile walk. And you've got to take the kids. Wah! You've got to take the children. Now, an adult could probably, on a good day, walk 20 miles. This is 25 miles away. They are commanded to go by God to those two mountains because we're going to have a church service like you would not believe. So my question would be, would I be willing to walk 25 miles to church? Our, <clears throat> our home in Temple, 47 Woodland Camp Road, out by Woodland Camp, is 12 miles from our office. Now, I could bike that in my younger days. But would I be willing to walk 25 miles to worship, to see you good people, to sing in the ensemble, to hear Randy preach? Would I be willing to walk a day on traffic on 113? I don't know, but they did. And I think what's interesting, too, is it wasn't just the Jews who went. Foreigners went. Because when you read Exodus, some of the people who came along with the Exodus out of Egypt were Egyptians. Now, did they die during the 30, 40 years of wandering? I don't know. Did they have children? Probably. Did their children enter the promised land? I don't know that. What I am suggesting is that this 25-mile march wasn't just the Hebrew nation. There were probably some Egyptians. And I know for a fact, I think I know for a fact, Rahab was there. Remember her? The prostitute who, took, who saved those two spies and whose apartment was saved? Rahab joined the Israeli camp, and I'll bet you a cup of coffee. She was there at this worship service. Okay, so let's unpack this worship service. Now, I'm quoting now from the English Standard Version Bible Commentary, ESV Bible Commentary. Uh, if you have a Bible commentary, you know, by all means, check me out. But here's what the ESV Bible commentators suggested. You got six tribes on Mount Ebal with the 12 bad blessings. A bad blessing will be yelled, and the people will say, Amen. Don't sleep with your, your husband's mother-in-law. Amen. Don't change borders. Amen. Don't lie. Don't cheat. Amen. Now, when you read about all this and what the priests and what Joshua had to read, I don't think there was any way they could have read from the first five books of the Bible. Those are the first five books of the Old Testament. Moses wrote them. So what the commentators all agreed on was that Joshua and the priest probably just read the highlights, the big ones, and especially the Ten Commandments. Okay? Now, over on Mount... Eph uh, the other mount... Yeah. Uh, the good mount. Gerizim. Gerizim, okay. They would repeat the good blessings. Amen. Now get this. We will not sleep with their mother-in-law. Amen. We will not sleep with our mother-in-law. Amen. The ESV suggests that one side of the valley yelled and the other side repeated it. And then both sides would say, Amen. Here's my question. How could they hear? You saw a picture of the little village. You saw how high that mountain was. Where in the world are you going to get six tribes? And six tribes. Estimate between one and two million people. Where are you going to put them? And where are the priests? Where's Joshua? 
Whereas the Ark of the Covenant, right smack dab in the valley. One Bible commentator that I like to use, David Guzik, is really big in geography, and he likes to quote a lot of archaeology, and he said it's a natural amphitheater. It is a natural amphitheater. See, I'm still amazed you can go to the Capitol Rotunda and get 30, 40, 50 feet away from the tour guide, and the tour guide can turn his back to you and say something, and you can hear it 50 feet across. And I'm sure that you have been to theaters, open air theaters, where the acoustics are such that they don't need microphones. Well, Guzik suggests that this was a natural amphitheater, so it was easy for these six to hear, don't sleep with your mother-in-law. Amen. That may have been, perhaps, the most unusual church service in the history of the Bible. It's well worth reading. And I would suggest you use a couple of commentaries to get different spins on that. What I saw was Joshua, the priest, the ark in the middle, yelling out these blessings, and the people on both mountains doing as they were told to do, saying, Amen, Amen. But I want to ask you this question. Have you ever worshipped in enemy territory? This area hadn't been conquered yet, all they conquered was Jericho and the city of Ai. They have not yet conquered Shechem. Dinah said, I want to marry her. And the two brothers said, well, that's OK. That's fine. But we have a tradition in the Jewish religion. You need to be circumcised. You want to marry Dinah? You've got to be circumcised. He goes back. He tells all the males, listen, if we're circumcised, we can marry those Jewish girls. OK. So on the third day, Simeon and his brother go in and kill them all. Quite, quite a history. But we're not done. Okay? In Numbers chapter 35, this area says it'll become a refuge city. In Numbers 35, there'll be 48 cities in the Promised Land. 48 cities in the Promised Land. Six set aside as a refuge city, as a city you could go to to hide and be protected. This was such a city. So this area had a history then, and it has a history now. It is still somewhat sacred to the Jewish people because this is where the sign was given, the signal was given to renew the covenant. Many commentators suggest this is the beginning of Jewish worship for the first time. This event that took place in the valley with the 12 tribes renewing the covenant was a signal for the Jewish people to begin to practice monotheism of the one true God. We're sitting in a church today that has a history. Those of you watching on Facebook or YouTube, if you're members here at First Christian Church, I checked with um, Dick and Susan Engel this morning. This church is at least... 150 years old, at least 150 years old. Imagine the history of the men and women who served here, worked here, tithed here, preached here, sang here, taught here, to make it what it is today. So when I think of First Christian Church, I look at a history of 150 years. The church from which Margot and I came, Community Christian Church in um, Frankfurt, we started up in the Paul Phillippe Human Resource Center. Saturday nights, we'd get together, put up chairs, put up the sound system. When the service was over on Sunday, we then took it down. Some of the best years of our life. Building relationships, moving chairs, setting up, taking down. And then in 1991, we got our building. We're only 44 years old. We're young compared to First Christian. So just imagine it, and, and I may be talking about some of your relatives who were important workers and servants here in this church. This church has a history, and we're here today, I think, in part because of that history. I think that's why they were able to have that worship service. That area had a history, even to the enemy, even to the Gentiles. So they must have respected Abraham and Joshua and Joseph. So we're going to close. 
with a whole bunch of open-ended questions. And what I would like for you to do in your own way, in your own time, answer these. Okay? Joshua read all the words of Moses. He wrote the first five books of the Old Testament. So probably just the highlights, as I've mentioned, plus the Ten Commandments and the curses. After all was read, the people, including the foreigners and Rahab, were to say amen. How could they hear? Is this a miracle? If Guzik is right in his archaeology interpretation, blueletterbible.org, the natural amphitheater, so God could have used that natural valley to magnify the voices so everybody could hear. Because if you're going to say amen to something, what does that mean? You heard it and you, you agreed. You heard, you understood. You heard and you agreed. So I think, this is just me, I think this was a major miracle of worship. Question. Can you explain the worship service in the valley between Mount Ebal and Gerzim? They listened, they repeated, and they agreed to obey and trust in God. And they said, Amen. How long do you think that Amen will last? Any guesses? Joshua has a lot more than eight chapters. We're going to have two more chapters. We've got to take a look next week at Caleb, an 85-year-old senior citizen who's going to charge up San Juan Hill and take this for God. And then we have to close our study with Joshua's famous statement. As for me and my family, we're going to serve the Lord. Amen. Oh, thank you. Okay. So we've got two more. We'll take a look at Caleb at the age of 85, and then we'll close out with Joshua. Then we'll proceed on with, with something else. But my question is, you've read the Old Testament. How long do you think that amen will last? Those of you who have read Joshua or Numbers, or judges. 20 years? Till they all died? Well, one of the fascinating things that I have learned in, in preparing some lessons on judges, if you had a good judge, the land was at peace. The good judge died, and boom, baby, they go right back to sinning. I'm suggesting this amen didn't last very long. So here's my question for you and me. Was their amen sincere? I think it was at the time. Was it truthful? I think it was. Was it heartfelt? Hope it was. What about mine? Those of you who feel comfortable in amening something that Luann says or something that Randy says, how long will that amen last? Amen means I heard it and I agree with it. I wonder how long that amen will last. So my bottom line question is this. Does worship change me? When we leave here at 9 o'clock or 11 o'clock or when you um, turn off the YouTube or Facebook and the worship service is over, are you changed? Do you gain information? So let me just share one thing I gained this morning from Randy's sermon. Never thought about it. I decided... With the red and the blue, I need to take notes. So I started uh, taking notes, and I have 10 little comments. Okay, And here's the one that blew me away. Think of all the good that's lost when people fight. Think of all the good that's lost when people are angry with one another. Think of all the good that's lost when we're divided. That's something to think about. That ought to at least change us until we get home and have lunch and take a nap. Let's pray. Before we pray, thank you for joining us on Facebook, and certainly thank you for uh, those of you people who are in the worship uh, service here. Lord, um, I am so thankful to Joshua. So many things he taught us. Um, I thank you for that uh, worship service there in the valley. That, that had to be an unbelievable church service with the echoing and the amening and the yelling of the blessings and the, and the, um, the curses and what have you. Uh, but it was a way in which you could get your people to realize that there is one true God 
You're in enemy territory. Get ready because the battle starts tomorrow. But I'll be with you if you'll follow me, if you'll believe in me, if you'll trust me, and if you'll listen to my word. I'll be with you if you'll be with me. So, Father God, that's my prayer. Keep us safe and healthy throughout the week is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.